Crystal, what do you like about reading? I actually love Andrew. Okay. I love breaking format. I do too. Do you want to break format today? Let's do it. Let's do it. Everybody, this is the Goldilocks and the Three Cares podcast, where we take a look at direct published work, what's too hot, what's too cold, and what's just right. I'm Andrew. And I'm Crystal. And we're going to break format today. We're, we haven't read a book this week. We're going to talk about a couple of themes that have emerged over the last 18 podcasts, the last year that we've been doing this. And that's an idea and how you get a crazy good idea, as mm-hmm. we've seen from some of them. I'm very jealous. <laughs> you can tell those ones because Andrew I, declares. I declare. That he's I'm jealous. jealous. Yes. And uh, and execution and and how those two are related. So today we're going to talk a little bit about when an idea starts to become something you need to shape and something you need to execute at a high level. But I really want to start off with something interesting that I found online, and we're going to go ahead and post the link in the description. But it's the the multiplier effect between an idea. And execution, and this is this is really something that came from the startup world. And they basically said that a bad idea is worth a dollar, and a great idea is worth a hundred dollars, and good ideas worth you know somewhere in between. It's what you do with it that counts, and how well you execute it. And you multiply that by you know a good idea worth ten dollars executed very well is worth ten million dollars. That's nice. the whole idea. You have to do both. You can't just have an idea in and of itself and I guess what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about inspiration. Crystal, you're working on a series. I am. And how did you get the idea for that? I didn't want to write Twilight. <laughs> so no vampires First, or werewolves. Point one. No vampires or werewolves. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I've i always sort of been drawn to angels and, uh, and demons, but uh, on one of my rather long walks at, uh, at lunch, I sort of stumbled upon the idea of what would happen if the serpent in, you know, the biblical story of Adam and Eve, what if that serpent was actually a man or a demon and he had some or a relationship with with Eve as opposed to the serpent tempting her to eat the apple. It was actually a man um, tempting her to eat the apple. And that that twist in the conflict fits with what we already know about, you know, the book of Genesis. Right, exactly. I was just playing with that idea and I thought that I came up with a interesting and unique twist on what people already know and elaborated on that. And there's other details. I'm sort of condensing this here, but um, to uh, just focusing on that sort of kernel, I thought that was a really good idea. And I'm hearing two things in your story and I know that this isn't alone, when we think of an idea, we always think of that flash of inspiration, right? right? You know, you're walking along and all of a sudden the the clouds break and the sun spot shines on you perfectly and birds are singing. There's harps, strangely enough. maybe enough, something angels. hits you in the face. And maybe if, this yeah. Tur- this took a dark turn. <laughs> it took, took a very dark turn. Um, and that inspiration just kind of washes over you and you're like, that's it. That's the idea. But on the other hand, I'm also hearing that there was some preparation involved, that your mind was already thinking in certain directions, that you'd already kind of done your research, your homework, that sort of a thing. How did those two reconcile? How do you kind of put them together? Yeah, I think this the idea sort of came about when I was playing with other ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had already started writing sort of some sketched out scenes, um, working with a couple of different characters that I liked, and then this sort of hit. And when it hits, it always feels like that. It always feels like, yeah. oh my God, you know. We're, wh- why is this the one time I don't have a pen and paper? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And luckily I did. And how did you, once you wrote it down, how did you know you had a good idea? There's kind of two things that go in with having or thinking you have a good idea. Um, for new writers, I remember you you write, you know, whether you're writing short stories or novels, you hold it very close to yourself and you're kind of in doubt oh as to whether the idea is good or not. Um, but deep down inside, you know. Yeah. You know. And But at that point in your career, you're really waiting to sort of hold that story or whatever it is, is out to someone who is knowledgeable or who you feel is an expert. Yeah. And they will tell you, oh, my goodness, yes, this is a good idea. Yeah. So you can, you're looking... I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You should just record that and we should just charge people, <laughs> charge people to hear Andrew say, That's I'm right. jealous. 
And so, you know, you want validation. Yeah. Hopefully, as you continue to write and as you continue to get comfortable with sharing your writing with people, as you should be doing, you that feeling in your gut should should grow stronger mm -hmm. because you need to have faith in yourself as a writer and have faith in knowing that you you have good ideas and this can work. Um, but then at the same time, as you're showing people your writing and your ideas, you know, it's so cliche to say this, but it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to write a book. And I've seen that written in multiple, multiple mm -hmm. books because it's absolutely true. You, you cannot anticipate every scenario, you know, someone else will see a different spin on it that sort of disrupts the flow of your plot. So they can be your, your barometer on how good your idea is, but at the same time, know in your gut and believe in, in what you want to write as well. And your gut gets stronger and, and gets more refined and pinpointed. I mean, I think every writer that I know has a book of ideas. Yes. But not all ideas are ideas, but not all ideas are good ideas and very few are great ideas. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have so many ideas that, you know, it's almost there, but not quite like, you know, mm. time travel taxi. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. It's not. It's it's not a great idea. I can see the poster now. Starring Channing Tatum. Yes, <laughs> and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah. Odd combination, Actually, but it somehow works. <laughs> you want to know what? I'd pay nineteen dollars to see that movie. <laughs> so would I, Andrew. We'll, so would we'll, I. We'll write a treatment after this podcast. So D deal. Once you have your idea, it's really getting it to the next level because it's going to be like a one-line description or a good hook. What are some of the things you should do to start stretching that out and turning that into a book or into a short story? That's a tricky question for mm -hmm. the reason that every writer works differently. Yeah. And I sort of want to encapsulate as many writers as I can because whether you're traditionally publishing or self-publishing, your process is your process. And you, bottom line, you have to figure out what works for you. If you have a system, keep using it. Right. But if you don't have a system, what do you recommend? Um... Outlining. <laughs> yeah. Um, to some extent. And this, again, differs from people. The amount of, from my perspective, the amount of outlining that you do is critical to moving forward with your novel uh, a bit faster mm -hmm. because you know where you're going. And in terms of that outlining, one of the things that I like to do is sort of go from the what if, so that's your, or for example, that I gave earlier, you know, what if the serpent in Adam and Eve was actually a man? And what if? Well, it turns into the, but why? Yeah. And so I'm going to switch to another example so I don't ruin my novel. Um, but let's go with a funeral. Yeah. So. Uh, there's a funeral. Yes. There's a funeral and the main character um, has come home for the first time in 10 years because she hasn't did hasn't want to see her mom and they don't speak together. But why? Because when she was, you know, 17 years old, she stumbled home one night and found her mother and her dad's best friend tumbling around on the couch with each other. But why? Well, because the main character's mother was trying to get back at the dad because he was embezzling money and she knew about it and she was feeling neglected and betrayed and it was a moment of weakness and this sort of just happened. I like this game, but why? <laughs> because the dad was actually being blackmailed by the best friend and the wife didn't know and the daughter is stumbling home upon this and... It all unravels at this funeral. Starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Emma Stone. Oh, can we throw Channing Tatum in there? <laughs> Channing Tatum's a dead dad. <laughs> <laughs> He's a dad. We'll put him in makeup. Okay. <laughs> all right. He has to be in every movie, and that's how we cast him. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's unspeakable. So what I'm hearing is that, you We know, can do him in flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> Channing, call us. Yeah, yeah. We have a role for you. <laughs> Doesn't pay well. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that, you know, you first take your idea and you kind of stretch it out with some of the what if games. And then after that, you've stretched it wide. You have to make it deep and you have to make it. Sorry to clarify. It's the, but why? Yeah. The, but why is the, the second what if, part. The what if is your, what if this happened? Exactly. Or what if, yeah. And then you ask a couple of those questions to Perfect. kind of stretch out the idea, but in order to make it deep. To make it yes. profound, to make it something that connects and resonates with people, you have to get 
a few layers deep in the butt wide. Now, I want to mention that's not my idea. I'd love to take credit for it, but... Go um, ahead and write it if you want, people. Uh, yeah, but I actually got that from, and I think I've mentioned it in another podcast before, Donald Mass. He's mm-hmm. one of the top agents in the U.S., and uh, he has a couple of really great uh, books on writing and how to make your story deep. So if you're curious about that, check him out. Now, this this sounds like we're kind of tipping over from the I have an idea with a good hook into here's how I'm going to do a good job and I'm going to execute well on it. Right. Yes. So now we're sort of bleeding into, in some cases, the ex- the execution. Mm-hmm. So from the good idea to executing that good idea in a way that doesn't make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you cry when you write, Crystal? It's not easy. Sometimes? Sometimes. But why? <laughs> because you're trying to put that beautiful idea that you've worked out in your head with the what if and the, the but why and trying to add description and um, depth of character and world emotion building. and world building. And, and, and there's so many elements that have to go together into a book. So this brings up an interesting point, I think, in that the writing isn't actually the hard part. No, is it? It's the editing. Yeah. That takes up the majority of your time and is the hardest part. Because it's easy to, you know, once you get into the flow of things, you're writing, you're like, oh my God, 1,500 words an hour. I'm a champion. It's middle of October. There's a lot of buzz about NaNoWriMo coming yep. up. And I've actually had a couple of people tell me that they're planning on, you know, writing their first book or writing their next book this November. That's a great way to bang through your first draft. Oh, yeah, definitely. But... At the end, you have 50,000, maybe even more words, which, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that's not a great achievement. That is, because I don't know that many people who have managed to do that. Nine out of every ten people that have told me they have an idea never even get to the point of finishing that first draft. Exactly. So, you know, by all means, drink a bottle, (laughs) drink a glass of wine. Drink responsibly a (laughs) bottle. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow. <laughs> Whoopsies. You know, congratulate yourself. Champagne, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, but also realize that you are about a third of the way up that hill. When you say a third, what do you mean? Like, how do you break down the time between that that planning and that, I, you know, the ideation and let's call it outlining the what if but why games versus the first draft versus... That hardcore editing and really shaping and molding. What's kind of the balance between those three? Well, um, again, this is for me. I'd say it's 20% outlining. Okay. And then 30 to 40 writing. Okay. And then the rest is editing. So it's almost half. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because I think your your first draft, at least for me, it literally, as I was saying, it's that free flow writing of you have your outline or you may not have your outline and you're just letting the characters move through the story. You're not really worried about description. At least <laughs> I'm not. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's elements. Your first draft reads like a screenplay. <laughs> it does. It does. But, you know, elements are missing. You don't You don't have the perfection of, you know, the the particular jewelry a character is wearing maybe you do but little details are not there Mm -hmm. and chances are the structure needs a lot of work as well yeah you gotta swap stuff so that's when you have your editing and some people would say that editing is really a mix of both rewriting because you're writing but to me that's still editing because you have your first draft you look at it you read it and you whether you take suck Suctions? Sections out. Yes, definitely take suctions out. <laughs> <laughs> Those are not good tools to my <laughs> So, you know, whether you're taking sections out and rewriting completely, mm-hmm. or you're modifying a paragraph, or you're moving sections around, or you're moving chapters around, or chunks of whatever, that's editing. That's yeah. not, to me, that's not writing. They're they're kind of two separate things. You need two different brains for them. Yeah, and when we do the, you know, um, too hot, too cold, just right, almost inevitably what ends up in the just right boils down to editing, pacing, yep. character development, 
spelling, grammar, you know, just uh, high sensory, level copy, you know, sensory, that, what were you, saying? you know, high level copy editing, okay. right? You know, um, that, that all winds up in the just right. Yeah. If you do it well, if you don't, it's almost invisible that you did, you know, one and a half drafts and then you kind of release that. Right. But it's not invisible to the reader. No. And it's a little bit about being picky Mm -hmm. as the author. And that's why I say it's two different brains. Because some of the books that we've read and we have not reviewed. And there have been a few. Or not critiqued, rather, I should say. It really reads like this person, they didn't take the time to actually sit and read and think, is this as alive as I can make it? Yeah. Whereas... You write that draft and you switch over to the editor's brain, which is really more of a reader's brain. And, you know, does this, is this part engaging? How do I make it more engaging? Am I, am I, is the reader really going to get what I'm trying to say here? Am I using the right words? It's, it's about shaping the story because you're being picky about it, but it's also because you want that vision of that great idea as close as, you know, bang on as you can get it on the page. So idea and execution are really tightly related. Yeah. Yes. That's the podcast we wanted to cover today. Just kind of summarizing the themes that we've seen about ideas and and how you execute that on the page. Crystal, we're doing this podcast a week early because when this drops on Wednesday, where are you? Yes, sir. I'm actually going to be in uh, B.C., I am attending the Surrey International Writers Conference. Uh, conference. I'm super stoked because it's my annual. Your, your third annual. My third annual, yeah. My That's third right. annual go and talk about writing and don't worry about, you know, what you're working on. Learn new techniques, meet new people, and just have an overall fantastic time. And if you can't meet up with Crystal at the Surrey International Writer Conference, where can you find us online? Everywhere. That was creepy. That was for Halloween. Yeah. That was good, right? <laughs> yeah. Don't do that again. Okay, I'm sorry. You can find us on Twitter at Everything's Temp, Facebook, Everything's Temporary, www.everythingstemporary.com, and YouTube, Everything's Temporary, and iTunes. That's a lot of places. It is. It is. Everybody, everybody, thank you very much for taking the time to listen. If you like what you heard, like it. Share it. Get the word out. I'm Andrew. And I'm Crystal. Until next time, keep reading. Everybody, welcome to the Goldilocks and the Three Cares podcast. The podcast where we normally take a look at what's too hot, too cold, and just right with Crystal losing it. <laughs> the light, like I can't look at you because I'm looking at you.